the uh, June 11 uh, Joint Conference Committee meeting for Laguna Honda. Um, we'll start with uh, the roll. Yes, I'll start with you, Commissioner Guillermo. Present. And Commissioner Green. Present. And I will read the land acknowledgement. Uh, the San Francisco Health Commission acknowledges that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Would you like me to call the items? Sure. The okay. second item on the agenda is the approval of the May 14, 2024 JCC minutes. Okay, you have the minutes before you, uh, and I'll ask for if there is any public comment. There, um, there is one hand and one person who's received um, accommodation. Before we go to public comment, could we get uh, motions just so we have it as a okay. first and second? Sure. Is there a motion? Yeah, I would approve with one correction, which is on uh, page three of seven it, in under commissioner comments. It says Mr. Balajit, and I believe it's it, it's Mr. Sanka. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, I will make that change. Make the move to approve. Okay, thank you. Um, and we can go to. There's no public comment in the room, so we'll go to the one person. Mr. Manette Shaw, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh. You've got something going on at your computer, Mr. Manette Shaw. Can you turn off the monitor or turn off the volume? We're not able to hear that, Mr. Manette Shaw. Here, I've muted you. Could you um, turn off your monitor, Mr. Manette Shaw? I think that there's feedback on our end. I'll give you another three minutes, but it was kind of hurting our ears on our end. Let's try this again. Continue CCBM program on all nursing units. HSAG further recommended focusing on the basics, like stronger support to middle managers, such as to nurse managers. Mr. Mitchell, uh, is it possible to repeat that because we didn't hear the first section? Or you can just turn it in. I, I just want to give you a chance. I know you like to be heard in these meetings. Okay, I see it looks like you've disappeared, but we'll try that some other time. All right, so uh, commissioners, please all in favor for approving the minutes with that correction. Aye. Aye. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, we can move on to the next item, which is the uh, general public comment. Folks, this is a time to make comment um, on something that's not on the agenda. We only have one person who's received um, permission to make remote public comment. I don't see him on with his hand up. I'll give it another 10 seconds. All right, uh, we can move on to item four, the executive team report, and please give me a, a second to pull that up. Okay, please begin, Mr. Pickens. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Roland Pickens, uh, director of the San Francisco Health Network, and uh, executive sponsor of the Laguna Honda uh, CMS Recertification Incident Command. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Diltar Sidhu, who is the assistant, one of the assistant nursing home administrators for Laguna Honda, and he's covering this week while Sandra Simon uh, is out, uh, out, out of the office. And we're also joined by other members of the leadership team at Laguna who are attending virtually and will be participating in today's uh, presentation. Uh, before I begin the actual report, we'd like to uh, provide some updates to the commission, particularly on the issue of admissions to Laguna Honda. Since announcing our recertification in August of last year, we've received many questions about uh, what that means for accepting new admissions to Laguna. Obviously, that is an excellent question because we recognize the critical role that Laguna Honda plays in the city and in the region. That's also why 
we've worked tirelessly since December on our Medicare recertification because full CMS certification requires um, certification in both Medicaid and Medicare. We plan to resume admissions at Laguna when we are fully certified in CMS, meaning we've attained that one missing piece, the CMS Medicare recertification. We believe that's important because it will show all members of the community, our residents and their families, that we have the full stamp of approval of our regulatory agency for providing safe, quality care to all who come to Laguna. While we are still awaiting that final Medicare recertification, we've not wasted any time. Since December, our staff has been working on new admissions policies and procedures that have come before you, this group and you've approved those. And looking at every part of the admission process with a fine tooth comb. Soon, we'll be sharing those plans for admissions uh, back here with the with the um, JCC and Health Commission, and then with our staff as we prepare for the eventual uh, new admissions returning to Laguna Honda. Also, we're pleased to uh, report that we have reached out to uh, all of those residents who had previously transferred to other facilities, uh, the ones that are, are still uh, in facilities, and many of them have expressed a desire to return to Laguna Honda. Uh, our staff continues to be in touch with them, and as soon as uh, we are able, we'll be uh, making arrangements uh, to have them go through the process to make sure they're still, they still meet, particularly the, the new admission criteria that uh, uh, this group has approved, and then we will begin to repatriate them as quickly as possible. Again, the details, uh, this is all driven by our notification of full recertification. Uh, so once we receive that, we'll be able to then uh, have more detailed specific dates. Right now, we're still waiting on that notification from CMS. So let's go ahead with the uh, presentation. As I just stated, uh, Laguna Honda remains focused on our Medicare recertification. As you will recall, uh, in December of 2023, uh, we participated in a Medicare uh, certification survey. And again, in April of 2024, uh, we received the preliminary findings from that December uh, survey. Uh, we developed plans of correction, submitted them, and on May 30th, uh, surveyors returned to Laguna Honda to validate those plans of correction. Uh, as we reported uh, at our last meeting, we were pleased to share that there were zero deficiencies and findings in that validation report, which means uh, at this point, we are now just waiting to hear from CMS in terms of um, our ability to be reinstated into the Medicare program, which will then give us full uh, certification and thus start the timeline for discussions and dates about uh, resuming uh, admissions. Next slide. Here we're sharing our usual report, uh, basically giving you the key statistics. Obviously, there have been no new admissions uh, that have occurred while we are still not fully certified. Uh, you see the number of discharges that have occurred over the last 15 months. Uh, and the number of expirations that have occurred over the last 15 months. Uh, again, as you know, this is an his, uh, a historic chart that we've used and are looking forward to the day when we'll be able to, again, report that there are new admissions uh, to Laguna, but we'll continue to use this format. Next slide. Would also like to update you on the, uh, the status of residents who no longer meet skilled nursing level of care. Uh, we, the group is actively working uh, on um, that population, and in fact, um, Diltar is the lead executive who oversees that uh, discharge process for the non-skilled uh, residents. He's been leading the team, working with other city uh, and community benefit organizations uh, to identify appropriate discharge destinations for those residents. Uh, Currently, um, there are 34 residents at Laguna 
who uh, no longer ha have a need for skilled nursing level of care. And since we initiated uh, the discharge, re-initiated the discharge process in April of last year, we've discharged a total of 30 individuals uh, who no longer have skilled nursing needs uh, to other placements in the community. Um, we are encouraged uh, by the uh, level of learning that this process has given to our staff so that when we do resume admissions, we think we have a really good uh, process in place to keep the flow going so that individuals uh, can move to the appropriate level of care, there, thereby making Laguna more accessible to more uh, individuals once new admissions begin. Uh, and next slide. And to present our final slide that spots, spotlights uh, resident programming, uh, Assistant Nursing Home Administrator Jennifer Carden Wade uh, leads many of these efforts, and she will uh, update you on this uh, slide. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you, Roland. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Nice to see you virtually. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how we have been increasing and uh, adding more resident programs as we've been uh, getting further out and away from uh, COVID. So uh, some of the things that we have improved upon and actually just grown tremendously has been resident council. Resident council is led by residents. We have co-leaders. What we did uh, within the last couple of years is change it into a hybrid model. So we have folks who can patch in on Zoom from their rooms, from the great room on the units, or they can come join us in person. And it's an area, an opportunity for residents to voice anything they want and be heard by the facility. And then we work with them to, to get answers to their questions. At that same meeting, we actually gather ideas about what they might like to do here while they're with us at Laguna Honda. Uh, one, I, I will say that the activity therapy department has grown tremendously over the past year, and that has definitely allowed for us to be able to expand our activity program as well as with new staff comes different ideas. One of our activity therapists thought about talking with her with her residents on South 3 they wanted to have a Domino's term, term, tournament. <laughs> so they thought about the resident clubhouse. And so there have been two to three activity therapists who've really taken this on. We have tables set up and all kinds of music. There's board games, there's cards. Um, residents from across different units are able to come together and play their favorite games. And it's got a really cool, um, it's really lovely. It's just really lovely and it's fun. It's on Friday afternoons. And so it's like a sort of like a Friday afternoon, Friday night hangout. In regard to our outing program, the activity therapy program is also the host of those programs. And we've started slowly. We've been doing what we call city tours, which are residents going out on the bus and seeing the city, the peninsula, Ocean Beach, sometimes to Pacifica through Golden Gate Park. We've been able to do uh, specialized and focused outings with individual residents, including a, a Buddhist temple celebration, a special birthday celebration, took somebody to Oakland for barbecue, which was really sweet, and then um, go, going to some coffee shops and movies. Uh, and the next step there is to be able to train some of the newer staff and the safety protocols to make sure that we're able to provide safe and enjoyable outings for all, but that's definitely going to grow. And finally, um, we have one activity therapy supervisor who's dedicated to hospital wide activities. So we have a monthly calendar and we, our goal has been to add 1 or 2 resident. Driven resident chosen activities to the monthly program. The monthly calendar, uh, it has really grown quite a bit in the last few months since we've had this AT supervisor who's full of really wonderful creative ideas who likes listening to the residents and trying to incorporate uh, what they're asking for. So we have bingo, Tuesday bingo, Tuesday afternoon bingo. That's the place to be at Laguna Honda. And we have movie um, nights. We have, uh, what do you call it, matinees. Uh, we started our animal socialization program again. So some of our animals that are on the farm come up in the art studio that is, when the art studio isn't in use for art, 
on Mondays and um, we have some really lovely fluffy bunnies and um, guinea pigs and our cats that come up and, and it's really lovely and staff enjoy that as well. We have a karaoke and we've been sponsoring more concerts here. Um, we have a lot of choirs that like to come through here to provide concerts on the weekends. And we are also ramping up on our culturally focused events. So we recently had a mariachi band in celebration of Cinco de Mayo. Just this past weekend, we had a pride march with the sisters who came. Uh, sisters of Perpetual Indulgence were able to make a quick visit here with us. And then we're planning on Juneteenth in a couple of weeks. And then we will also, um, one of my favorite events that we do with the residents is actually take one of our vans and take them to Pride. And we lead the, uh, the DPH contingents. And it's just a special, really wonderful event. So um, we're looking forward to continuing to build out that program. Mm -hmm. Very excited that we have a new, um, new activity therapist from different walks of life with different ideas that are really reflecting our resident population and, and really thinking about creative ways to keep everybody um, healthy and active. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So that concludes uh, our formal presentation and at the appropriate time, we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions or hear your comments. Thank you, Mr. Pickens. Do we have any public comment? Yes, we do. Um, I need um, like 20 seconds to pull up something. I need to close out a file first and then uh, be able to pull up the um, chart that the member of the public would like me to show. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Manetcha, are you there? I am. I want to apologize for the audio interference on WebEx before. It's okay. It happens. Um, thank you for apologizing. I'm going to share this document, and then once I share the screen, I can't mute you or unmute you. So, um, but I can still talk. So I'll let you know when the when the timer starts. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. The image is up. You may begin. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you. As I previously testified, Nursing Home Administrator Sandra Simon has been LHHS CEO since June 2023. She should present these executive team reports, as Larry Funk and John Keneally always had done. Since HSAG left in May, Pickens should relinquish his acute care hospital management grip on LHH as a so-called, quote, incident commander, end quote, and let Simon take over. As my handout today shows, there are noticeable math discrepancies on Pickens' fourth slide, reporting LHH has discharged 30 residents no longer having SNF level of care needs, but still has 34 such residents who are essentially receiving board and care services, not skilled nursing services, for a total of 64 such patients. My chart shows Pickens' March 12th presentation reported a total of 66 non-SNF patients. Why is there a discrepancy of two non-SNF patients across recent reports? My chart shows eight patients were reported discharged, but shows a balance of 10 fewer residents. Is this the new math? On May 21st at the Full Health Commission, Pickens stated at 28 minutes, seven seconds on videotape, quote, in April of 2023, we had almost 90 residents at LHH who didn't have skilled nursing level of care needs, unquote. I re-listened to the tape closely several times. Pickens definitely said there had been 90 patients without SNF care needs. What happened to the difference of 24 patients between the 90 he claimed on May 21st and the combined total of 64 patients reported on today's slide number four? Does Pickens have a veracity problem? What other incorrect statements has he presented to you and members of the public? Slide number two says LHH is still waiting for its recertification from CMS. Is that because the backlog in anonymous complaint investigations is still delaying recertification? Thank you. All right, that is the only public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions or comments, Commissioner yes. Green? Well, first of all, not only thank you for the presentation, but how wonderful to hear about all these activities. It's have to have been so difficult during the pandemic for people to be so isolated. And it sounds like you really ramped up with great speed, and it obviously will show in both the experience of the residents as well as their morale. Do any of the, I have a question, do any of the staff participate in the karaoke? <laughs> Good question, Jennifer. Yes, they do. 
many. That's great. Yeah, because it is like, you know, the residents, I'm sure, feel very much like the staff are, are family to them. And I, I think that's fantastic. So thank you for sharing that. Um, in, in terms of the recertification, if I've heard right, we're as far along as we can possibly be that we may hear soon from Medicare and that once we do, although obviously there will be fries, there will be anonymous complaints. But from what I recall from the last meeting, our sense is that if any of those were going to call a halt to the fast momentum, and it's so clear um, where we were a year ago and where we are now in terms of the surveyors and the way they're seeing the work. Um, would you anticipate any, um, you know, unknowns here? I mean, sure. th there sort of seems to be a real rhythm and momentum that would make us think that we are more on the confident side than the anxious side here. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. And I've racked my brain. Um, as best I can tell, we are at the precipice of uh, recertification. Um, I see I do not see anything in the path that would uh, uh, derail that um, um, forward progress. Uh, and again, we've completed everything on our side and are just waiting on uh, our um, government uh, bureaucracy of regulators to go through their process that they control uh, to uh, give us that official notification. We, are, we have every reason to believe uh, it is imminent uh, obviously, uh, we don't control the date that they give it to us, but uh, all indications uh, that we've had from them are that we should expect it uh, soon, uh, that there are no other hurdles in terms of uh, our uh, ability to meet the Medicare uh, requirements. Great. Thank you. That was the only question I had and the karaoke question. <laughs> I, too, want to congratulate uh, um, Ms. Carton Wade on uh, her report on the uh, resident programming and obviously uh, the work that you've done to sort of bring all of the back into play and looking forward to seeing more of that happening, uh, particularly with, you know, the anticipation of the recertification and knowing that there are going to be more residents either coming back or new. Uh, and so for them to be able to do that and then have all these activities uh, that they're going to be able to join uh, sort of in a revived uh, a facility that is going to be uh, both about an increased um, uh, safety uh, and um, and operations, but really sort of more uh, sort of a, a more changed environment on the sort of s social environment and uh, interaction. Um, I did um, sort of uh, wondering uh, if you um, had any sense that there were more activities that were more popular than others. Uh, that folks seem to be gravitating towards and and you know if, if you're sort of uh, aware of that and you know what might happen sort of next steps to bring uh, similar type of activities into sort of the popular sphere. And I, I, I sure. Jennifer has that detail before she gives it. I think it's also important to note that um, prior to and during COVID the activity therapy staff was pretty decimated. Uh, at one point, she had half, only half of the positions filled, and there is a dedicated activity therapist for each unit. And so for the last two years, they've all had to carry a double load. But now uh, she's filled all of her positions. Almost, almost, almost. there. <laughs> and so we are really poised as we begin to prepare for it, uh, resuming admissions to have a, a, a much more robust uh, activity therapy um, offering for the residents. But go ahead, Jennifer. Sure. Um, so bingo, uh, all things go through bingo. <laughs> I mean, that's really, uh, it's incredible. Having said that, I know that folks are really interested in outings. And I know they're interested in going to museums, uh, different kinds of restaurants. Uh, where else have we been before? And um, we're also open, right, to these new areas that folks may not have gone to before. Um, you know, our tried and trues used to be uh, restaurants and movies and sometimes parks. And so, uh, but now we have these really cool street fairs, right? And some, as our clientele's a little bit younger sometimes, and we'll see what happens as we move forward with uh, admissions, you know, uh, uh, people like a good street fair, you know, and so 
we're really trying to stay open to listen to people um, about what they might want to try, and then we will work to make that operationally safe and sound so that we could give it a go, even if it's with a smaller group, and then we would duplicate it. Um, having said that, though, I, I do think aside from bingo, animal socialization is pretty great. It's pretty wonderful. Uh, and so uh, maybe adding another day of that um, people really we're really focusing on weekends too because it does tend to be a little quieter around here so movie matinees with um, raffles are also very uh, popular also mahjong uh, we have a volunteer who has been doing mahjong for i think 13 years prior to prior to the pandemic and he's back and when i came in one saturday mahjong was hopping like everybody, like people who didn't know how to play Mahjong, they wanted to learn how to play Mahjong, so maybe we'll get a second table, you know, I, I don't know. So we're really trying to follow, um, to your point, what the residents are asking for, what seems to be popular. We do um, ask for a thumbs up, thumbs down after the activity, uh -huh. and um, we mostly, I, I don't think we've had anything that we've done under 90% thumbs up. I mean, people are just really happy. <laughs> to be doing things. And so I think people also enjoy music. So as we're getting more concerts, um, of a, a more, more choirs and inquiries of that nature, we'll continue to, to do that. And, and I will say that, you know, we, we do like bringing our residents together for, um, their marches. And so, um, like, we bring residents down from both towers to come down to, um, we did one for Black History Month, I believe that's what they, how it came together for, for Pride, and we may do it again for Juneteenth about bringing people from both towers, bringing them down together to the centralized area near the atrium where people can come together, and then we have sometimes poems and, and, uh, and songs and things like that for people to come together, so residents tend to enjoy that as well. Well, that's great. And, you know, I'm thinking like in, in a city like San Francisco or even in the Bay Area with so much to offer, uh, you know, that there is going to be, uh, you know, it can't be a dearth of things, right, to uh, bring the residents to uh, safely and uh, in an organized uh, fashion. I think you know, street fairs would be great, but I don't know how I'd be able to, um, you know, sort of keep track of everyone. But uh, well, it would be a very small group. Very small, yeah. <laughs> like one okay. to one. So we do. Uh, so we do go to um, the AIDS walk annually, hmm. and that's like a similar, you know, and that's pretty much one to one. You know, we it's the AIDS walk stroll per se, but there's a handful of residents that do go to that, and we go out there amongst the crowd. We go for a little walk, and then we come back. So we do have experience, you know, having the larger crowd situation. But to your point, it's 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 nearly one to one during that. So wow, that's that's a great ratio. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um, well, again, you know, really really happy to hear about all the activities and ninety percent satisfaction. I mean, who can who's gonna you know sort of be able to compare to that, right? So congratulations and look forward to hearing more about and maybe some pictures and short video or something at some point just to get a sense of it uh, would be great. Uh, I had uh, one question about uh, the discharge update. Um, so if there are um, 34 residents that are still there that are uh, not needing care, I'm just curious about, and you talked about sort of the, the, the staff now has sort of uh, figured out the flow once folks start coming back in. Where are, where are those 34 residents um, residing now? Are they sort of dispersed throughout or are they in one place and who, who, how do they get cared for or what's their level of care since they're not SNF per se? Yeah. Okay. So this gentleman leads that effort out. He's probably the best to give you that answer. Good afternoon, commissioners. So those 34 residents are throughout the SNF. Um, I'm sorry, they were what? They are spread throughout the SNF and all units. Um, they're still being covered under custodial law, and we continue to work with different partners in finding uh, appropriate placements, working through different barriers, uh, so we can provide a safe discharge locations for them. 
And they still receive this, I'm sorry, you, that they still receive the same level of care as if they were a SNF then? Yes. Pay, uh, yes. Resident. We provide the same care, uh, whether it's ADLs, medication management, all the care that they need, we still continue to provide that care. Okay, so th that was really sort of the, the only question I had about uh, about that, but thank you. Thanks thank for you. the work, and I know how difficult it is to try to, you know, sort of, an, uh, you know, plan for, you know, the discharge at the same time, knowing that we're going to be, we you know we need those slots, right, uh, at some point as things uh, sort of move forward with the recertification. But thank you for your work. Shall we move on to the next item? Yeah. Uh, item five is the hiring and vacancy report. Hi, commissioners. Uh, good afternoon. Happy to present the um, vacancy report, the staffing report for Laguna for the month of May. Um, Laguna vacancies stand at 9.4%, seeing a nominal rise from the 8.6% in May. We hired a total of 28 employees in various classifications between May 1st and May 30th and had six separations during the same period with no retirements recorded for the month. We continue to prioritize and support the hiring of the registered nurse uh, class 2320. Vacancy rate currently stands at 5.5, 11.1 vacancies. Of the 11.1 .1 vacancies, we're currently processing onboarding for three of the positions and the rest of the vacancies, we have candidates moving through the selection process. With regards to nursing managers, the 2322 classification, we continue to move candidates through the selection process for the five remaining vacancies that we have open. The next steps of the process are pending the availability of the new list. There are currently eight openings for the 2312 licensed vocational nurses, for which we are um, in the midst of the onboarding process, all the eight candidates moving through the onboarding process with start dates uh, during the month of June. The hiring team is also continuing to process vacancies within several classes through an efficient batch hiring process. We're currently hiring for the 2593 health program coordinators three and second batch of the 2903, uh, the hospital eligibility worker classifications for the 2593 classification. We're currently onboarding eight of the 13 candidates and with the 2903s, uh, we have 21 vacancies of which um, 13 uh, positions are in the approval stage. Seven uh, positions have candidates moving through the selection process. As we look to fill the vacancies across DPH, the batch hiring process continues to help identify efficiencies and ensure a better outcome for both candidates and hiring managers. The HR team continues to hold planning meetings with exec leaders and hiring managers on a weekly, monthly basis to go over vacancy information and hiring plans. Um, uh, RN highlights for the last month, seven uh, RNs registered nurses and one P103 started last month. As for the non-RN highlights, we had one uh, senior physical therapist, uh, the classification uh, 2558, who started last month. And we had three uh, patient account clerks uh, 1637 start last month, and we had 1942 manager 7 start last month. Um, thank you, commissioners. I'll take uh, any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, Priya. Is there any? Yes, I see one hand. <clears throat> Mr. Manchal, you've got three minutes. Thank you. As I testified last month, LHH's facilities maintenance department was thrown into turmoil after LHH's nursing home administrator for support services, Dilter Sadu, was first hired and began interfering in the facilities department. Today's LHH vacancy report by FTE, with a run date of data through May 31st, still shows that a job class number 7203, building and grounds maintenance supervisor, and a job classification number 7205, Chief Stationary Engineer position are both still vacant. There are two vacancies in job classification code number 8211, Supervising Building and Grounds Patrol Officer, 
and 5.5 vacancies in job classification number 7524, institution utility worker, along with one vacancy in job classification number 7335, senior stationary engineer. The number 7524 vacancies are unchanged since the May report. More disturbing, the May vacancy report by FTE, with a run date through April 27, showed LHH had 21 budgeted FTEs in job classification number 7334 and had five vacancies, but today's FTE report shows the number of budgeted number 7334 positions has dropped by two to just 19 budgeted positions and still has four vacancies. In the summer of 2023, LHH had been given an additional six budgeted 7334 FTEs at a cost of approximately $945,367 due to immediate jeopardy citations involving facility maintenance and fire alarm deficiencies. Why are those budgeted positions being suddenly cut back? Did you think nobody would notice? Why has LHH now cut the number of budgeted 7334 FTE positions? Is LHH itching for more immediate jeopardy citations that could delay its recertification by CMS? Why aren't you, as commissioners on this JCC, asking these kinds of oversight questions? By report, the facilities department's current staff may remain unable to deal with any type of building emergency, placing LHH at risk for additional state immediate jeopardy citations. Is this what you, as JCC commissioners, Expected from Dilter Sadu's so-called new era of leadership as an assistant nursing home administrator? Reports on the internet indicate the nursing home Dilter worked at as a nursing home administrator before he was hired at Laguna Honda had been decertified. Thank you. That's the only public comment. Do you, uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. Commissioner Green? Yes, thank you for your report. I did have one question, which is, you know, as we look forward to admitting more residents to Laguna, how are you planning in terms of staffing? Because I mean, there's a certain number of positions you'll undoubtedly need to um, increase. And I gather on purpose, we didn't diminish staff in the course of, of, of the um, process we've gone through in the last few years. But yet I'm, I'm curious to know not only how you are looking, I mean, it's a huge number of staff in all kinds of areas, but how you're looking at that and then at what point a given number of residents would trigger, you know, what's the structure now where if you get a certain number of residents, you have to add more individuals and in which divisions and so forth. And how, how's that thinking going forward? So the process you just described is indeed the one that the admissions group that's being led by the chief medical officer, Dr. Albert Lamb, and by the nursing home administrator, Sandra Simon, they're actually doing that. They are looking at what are the number of staff that are needed in each discipline in order to provide care for X number of residents. And they have the thresholds as to when you reach this point, you need to add an additional in this particular category. So that process uh, uh, has been done and will inform then uh, the ability uh, to resume admissions. When we come before you with the admissions presentation, you will see a very detailed process that uh, has a start date, uh, allows for some admissions, then a period of, uh, of a pause in order to reflect, to make sure that all the systems are working properly, and then moving on to additional uh, admissions, having another pause, PDCA, making sure the process uh, is correct, including staffing. And in terms of staffing, uh, there have been tremendous gains actually over the last several months, uh, not only within the nurse hiring, but also in the other positions. For example, the activity therapist, where Jennifer says all of her positions are filled except for one. That's a huge improvement over a year ago when she had uh, five or six vacancies. Uh, and the, it's also important to remember that during this whole time of two plus years that we've not had admissions, we never stopped the hiring process. And so um, uh, hires have continued to be made. Uh, we have approximately 300 fewer patients, uh, residents than we had at the time of decertification with even more staff than we had uh, at the time of decertification. Well, thank, thank you for letting us know. And I, th I think it might be really helpful um, to see if it's already been completed, what the what you're thinking. I think we helped to understand the vacancy rate, the vacancy information and the hiring information if we had some context. So if that's possible, I'd, lo I'd love to see that or have the JCC 
see you know, how your thinking has evolved and because it is a little confusing because I know you you didn't um, you you didn't diminish the staff obviously there have been retirements and so forth but I'm I'm not sure I understand how all the moving parts work anyway and it would be really helpful to have that context. Okay, we'll we'll ask uh, the H uh, under Priya our director of HR operations to work with. Uh, Dr. Lamb and Sandra uh, on that to maybe do some overlays of staffing as it relates to um, patient volumes, uh, particularly the, uh, new anticipated volumes. Yeah, we don't want to create any extra work, but if I heard you correctly, it sounds like it's already somewhat established. So if there's anything you already have um, that you could share, that'd be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know if it's, it's uh, directly related to the sustainability uh, plan, uh, but I'm assuming there's some connection yeah. there, so it would be part of that work. And so again, it, it does remind me that um, we do uh, uh, we we are due a, a presentation at some point, uh, and um, I think I can't remember if I asked this question in the past, but with regard to the presentation of that sustainability plan, uh, that uh, when can we anticipate it? after the recertification and who will be participating in that presentation might this also just as an adjunct might this hr uh, the request about the staffing be part of that or is that going to be something that we look forward to separately so in terms of the uh, the scheduling of the presentation on sustainability we had that discussion just today with uh, uh, director colfax and uh, deputy director uh, baba and so we're in the process of um Developing that and I think having dialogue with uh, JCC and health commission leadership on when to bring those before you uh, we've done. Um, they're pretty much almost ready to come forward and again, we want to make sure that there were no uh, unexpected surprises in the notification for Medicare for Medicare certification that might. Uh, uh, might require us to make changes. We're not anticipating that, but just to be sure, that's why we, we've, we've held off until the, the certification. Uh, but we will um, um, uh, be bringing both the sustainability plan. I think the current thinking is that we want to present the sustainability plan first, uh, but on the heels of that, present the uh, admissions plan. They are separate, but there is uh, an, uh, some overlap uh, between them. Uh, because the sustainability plan then uh, informs the pace at which uh, uh, particularly new admissions uh, can begin. Great. Um, I did have then one uh, final question on the uh, vacancy report. So given that there uh, is a less reliance on a contracted uh, nursing, but that we still have uh, a number of nursing vacancies, are are we uh, noticing or are we experiencing any uh, any issues with so the staffing levels across all the different um, uh, uh, shifts and is that something that uh, that comes up at all? Yeah, it, it doesn't come up. It's not a concern. We get a report every day of staffing uh, for every shift for every unit, and um, we we uh, meet and always exceed. Uh, the uh, required uh, staffing for for all the units. So we've uh, there have been no deficits in the area of staffing. Okay, well that's good to hear because uh, again, I mean, just thinking about the implications of that in terms of potential um, reports or complaints or such. That's something that we want to try to uh, minimize as much as possible. So okay, great. So looking forward to seeing uh, more uh, more of the hires and then the uh, the request that uh, President Green has uh, requested in, in line with the admissions plan and the sustainability plan all coming soon because we do anticipate getting that recertification letter uh, like any second actually. So thank you again for your report. We can go on. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to item six regulatory affairs report. Thank you Priya. Hello, good afternoon, commissioners. I will be sharing with you the regulatory affairs report. Um, the report is reflective of activity for the month of May. Uh, for the month of May, Laguna Honda submitted 17 facility reported incidences to CDPH and we received zero anonymous complaints. 
Um, of those 17 cases, none have been investigated at this time by CDPH. During the month of May, we also did host one site visit with CDPH. We had three surveyors on site. This was for our revisit survey related to the two plans of correction that were submitted uh, earlier in the month on May 22nd. And of course, we were very delighted to um, have an exit conference with zero preliminary findings. Um, and as noted, two plans of correction were submitted and cleared for the month of May. You'll see that all the open cases are still listed on this report, as I have shared with you in, in previous months. I, I'm waiting for official word in writing before I clear these out from our record. Uh, so now we'll continue to share with you the reports that go back to 2019 in hopes that when we do receive certification, we'll also receive um, formal written response that some cases have been closed out. Happy to take any questions or hear any feedback. Thank you, Naz. Is there public comment? I see a hand. So I'll, let's check in. Mr. Manette Shaw, do you have a comment for this item? I do. Thank you, Mark. Okay. During the May LHH JCC meeting, Commissioner Green noted CDPH hadn't investigated all the facility reported incidents, FRIs, that occurred before September 2023. Mr. Sunga stated that once CDPH confirms all the incidents have been investigated and closed out, LHH will update its graph. But it's not clear from today's regulatory affairs report whether all of the pre-2023 FRIs have been fully adjudicated and closed out by CDPH and how many more still need to be investigated. Worse, this month's regulatory affairs report shows on slide number 7, titled Anonymous Complaints 2019 to Current Present, that the number of anonymous complaints in calendar year 2022 climbed by six more complaints than had been reported just a month ago during this JCC's May meeting. And the number of anonymous complaints in 2024 dropped by a whopping seven such complaints to 20 after first having been reported as 27 anonymous complaints in the May 2024 report to this JCC. What is this? Creative math? How can the anonymous complaints previously reported and presumably confirmed prior to reporting have dropped and increased for these two calendar years within just 30 days, particularly since today's regulatory affairs report does not indicate in the summary section any new anonymous complaints. More to the point, Commissioner Green had been concerned about the uninvestigated FRIs before 2023. But what about potentially uninvestigated anonymous complaints? Where does LHH and CDPH stand in resolving these backlogged investigations delaying recertification? Thank you. That is the only public comment for this item. Okay, any uh, questions or comments, President Green? Yes, thank you for the report and I really appreciate these graphs. They're, they're very helpful. Um, it would be um, helpful to get some clarification about um, 2023. It looks like, you know, when you look at the outcome of Fry's here that we still have some black columns, which means investigations not started. And so I'm curious to know it's so confusing to me with with you know the surveyors and what they do and don't do and what they decide to investigate or not. It seems very haphazard. And I, I guess the best thing that the best context I had was looking at that ProPublica thing that I brought up before, where you see every single sniff in the country has numerous ones of these and numerous investigations and some some with records that don't look very stellar per unit population compared to ours. But can you can you clarify and also I, I was trying to figure out whether we do have a graph where um, among the anonymous complaints we we know exist where they are as a separate graph compared to just our fries. Yes, can you I apologize Commissioner Green, can you repeat the second part of your question one more time just so I heard it correctly? Yeah, yeah the second part of the question was we we know about certain certain anonymous complaints have come up, we hear about them, but do we have any knowledge about those that there has been an investigated investigation started, or is it just completely unknown until they adjudicate them? Got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so, yes, in terms of the, the open cases in 2023, so as I was just sharing, I'm going to continue to keep those until I get official word from CDPH about any cases being administratively closed, which means without them either coming on site or completely 
uh, formally completing their on-site investigation. You know, there, as it was mentioned in our last month meeting, there is the um, intention of doing that with a number of our cases, um, but just me being formal, I do want it in a written format from CDPH that outlines it before we officially show it here in open session that all these cases have been closed. Um, the hope is that that will come shortly after certification. I will get that clearance and, and we'll be able to see that in this report. In terms of the anonymous complaints, it really is based on when they come and they inform us of the complaint. We, we don't know in advance. Um, as I also understand, they should be up to date on, on anonymous complaints. But again, that's only as good as what is shared with me. I don't have something in writing to formally prove that at this time. Okay, I mean, I should I should know this by now, but just just to clarify, because I won't ask again, I promise. So okay. once once you hear about an anonymous complaint, is it assumed that an investigation is going to be started, or is it just like click and you know see in two years? I mean, do, do we have any and do we get any indication? Usually, when we know about it, is when they are because they are starting their investigation. Investigation, okay, that that's really helpful. And and when we look at the the cadence of them resolving anonymous complaints, does it seem like in fact they're starting the majority of the time they're starting an investigation when we hear about it? Usually, yes. Okay. All right. That's all. I, thank you. I won't ask you're again. Welcome. I promise. No, you're fine. It's okay. I, I don't have any additional uh, questions, but just okay. wanted to also um, appreciate the graphs uh, that we received uh, in this report. It's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Nas. Let's move on to item seven, the Laguna Honda policies. And Commissioner, just a reminder that in addition to what's listed on your original agenda, um, there was the added um, uh, palliative care, which was added on Friday, that you have in front of you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I will pre be presenting 23 policies today, three hospital wide. All three are revisions. The first one is 25 08 management of parenteral nutrition, 60 10 environment of care program, 60 11 environment of care committee. There are 20 departmental policies um, for biomedical engineering. There are two revisions. The first one is CPP-004, defective equipment and device reporting, tagging and removal from service, and CPP-011, plan maintenance and on-time completion. For environmental services, there are eight revisions. The first one is policy number eight, uh, safety, policy number nine, waste management, policy 10, equipment, supplies and chemicals, Policy 11, standard cleaning procedures, st uh, policy 12, physician based precaution cleaning policies, um, policy 26, ice machine cleaning, policy 27, transport and delivery of um, biohazard trash and linen staffing, and uh, policy 21, um, reject, rejected linen procedures. There was one medical services policy. It was a revision. It is D16 clinical services for resident and patient with substance use disorder. And finally, there are nine nursing um, policies. All of them were revisions. The first one is C1.0 resident admissions and readmission, C1.2 relocation between Laguna Honda neighborhoods, and D1 2.0 resident activities of daily living, D6 2.0 transfer techniques. D 8.0 post uh, mortem care, uh, F 1.0 assistance with elimination, F 3.0 assessment and management of bowel functions, G 7.0 uh, obtaining, recording, and evaluating residents' weight, and K 4.0 application to heat or cold therapy. Um, and then adding the one last um, hospital wide on there, which is the, um, the hospice assessment, I believe, palliative care assessment. And that is all. Open to questions and comments. Any, uh, any public comment? I see no hands and there's no one in the room. Okay. Commissioner Green. Well, first of all, thank you so much for going over the list I, I provided and for um, answering those questions and making those few. Most of it was, was just some sentence structure and such. I did have a few questions and I, I must say when I did this, I was looking at a PDF and I put the page on the PDF. 
but it isn't the same as here, so I'm going to do my best to figure out what I'm talking about. So um, when we were talking about the um, policy about locking the doors, and I know that's been, been an issue, do you call the 3.30 to midnight shift the night shift? Because we call it the evening shift in our hospital, and we call the night shift midnight to 7. And when I read this, it says um, the policy reads the night shift personnel make locked doors rounds at 1130 and they have until the end of their shift. So I think if, if I'm understanding this right with your answer, which it says the PM shift personnel 330 to midnight, that should be the whatever you call the evening shift in that because I read it and I said, well, wait a minute, someone makes rounds at 1130 and then they don't have to complete making sure the doors are locked till 7 a.m. That that's the way it reads to me. I mean, I maybe have misunderstood it, but then with this clarification where it says um, it is a 3.30 to midnight, perhaps either that needs to be specified in the document that it is the 3.30 to midnight shift and remove the semantics of night versus evening versus whatever. But I think that's important at that particular area because it does imply that you have till 7 a.m. to make sure the doors are locked. So that that's, I mean, these are all little things, but you know, I'm so so nervous about the surveyors and all the nitpicking that's going on from bureaucracy that I, I would, I just want to make sure it's no one's going to come back and read that and raise a red flag. So that, that was one thing. Um, the, the other um, question I had was, I know members of the public are very concerned about um, ensuring that we have some, uh, some guardrails for people who simply by virtue of substance use or beha behavioral issues can't stay at Laguna. And this is where I'm sorry, I'm not sure what page on the PDF uh, on the on the um, PDF I'm looking at, but it's I, on, on that page 56, um, you refer back to policy 2428, and I don't know if that's in here. Somehow I could have missed it, but when I was reading this, I, I didn't see that part as part of this policy update, and and I just wonder whether it's worth in referring to the policy that specifically states that, you know, back in this section, because it's so critical, it goes through all the things we're going to do for individuals and all of the um, the efforts we'll make to help individuals who want to seek treatment. But it doesn't have that that um, part about and if all else fails. And I don't I don't know, I think with with the public anxiety about um, not ending up um, having our, our beds uh, occupied by people who we can't handle and therefore could be an issue for other residents, whether referring back to that particular policy, and it's well stated here in your response, but I wonder if referring back to that policy isn't worthwhile in this section of the document. Um, and then um, I think I think those are the other only, only things that um, beyond what you've already fixed and thank you that, that I have questions about. Thank you. I will bring that back to the owners and make the edits. Great. Thank you. So can we make sure that we get uh, a response to those uh, in a timely uh, fashion before we get to uh, next Tuesday's meeting? Yes, we'll do. Okay. Is there is there any reason that you might want to um, put a caveat on the, on the motion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do as we have done in the yeah. yeah. So I would move that um, we approve these policies, but uh, with clarification on um, the um, shift issue, um, which was part of environmental safety, and then the um, the um, question of whether we need to fortify that section on uh, behavioral health with a referral back re reference back to the previous uh, part of a policy. And thank you. I, I agree. It, it does make sense to include that specific policy uh, uh, because that was one of the early things we worked on during recertification. Uh, it's called an expedited discharge process where it's been determined that the individual, uh, either through their behavior or their uh, care needs related to uh, mental health or substance use, uh, cannot receive the care that they need at Laguna. And so there is a defined process to uh, expedite um, trying to find an alternative placement for those individuals. So I agree it makes sense to actually uh, include that as part. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing that then. Okay, I'm make, oh, so I'll second the motion. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you so much.
Thank okay, you, thank Carmen. You, Carmen. Uh, we can move on to a consideration of a closed session. Move to go to closed session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And I um, just want to make sure there was no public comment on that, even though the, the vote already happened. I see no hands. So, folks, um, we will be um, not in sight or sound while we're in closed session, but, but we, we will be back. Thank you for attending, and you're welcome to wait for us, but you won't see us until we're back into open session. And give me 30 seconds, commissioners and uh, staff. Um, commissioners, please consider a motion to um, disclose or not disclose discussions held in closed session. Move not to disclose. Second. And all those in favor? Aye. And then the magic moment, please consider um, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely day. You all too.